Do you like books? I mean, really, really like books? Then you're in the right place. Each week, your host, Sam Hankin, interviews the best of today's top selling authors and the up and coming superstars of modern literature. This is The Avid Reader. Here is your host, Sam Hankin. Hey, everyone. Thanks again, as always, for joining us here today. Um, today, we're going to be uh, interviewing Chang Rei Lee, talking about his new book, My Year Abroad, which was published last week by Riverhead. And um, all of you obviously are familiar with Chang Rei. In fact, there's someone at the bookstore who wanted to start a Chang Rei book club. I said, well, it would only last five months, but <laughs> now it can last <laughs> another month. <laughs> so in any event, and those five books would be Native Speaker, uh, Jester Life, Aloft, <clears throat> The Surrendered, and On Such a Full Sea. His new novel is, as I said, My Year Abroad. And the problem I have as a bookseller and doing the show for 600 authors is when you, when you read a really good book, uh, it's 500 pages long, it's kind of irritating because you're gonna read it in one sitting or one laying, which means you'll finish at four o'clock in the morning, which screws up your next day. So <laughs> it's like a mixed blessing. And, um, and also when you read a really good book that's 500 pages long that's filled with food and drink, you get really hungry and really <laughs> thirsty. And then you make yourself like either, you're gonna make yourself either mozzarella sticks <laughs> or you're gonna make yourself codfish ceviche, which I'm not gonna do. So it was basically, I did make an omelet is what I did. <laughs> so anyway, be, before we begin, I just wanna just go, uh, this is what I do. I, I'll let, I'll let Chang Rei talk in a minute. Um, when, I, when I began this book, I, I thought, okay, <clears throat> our protagonist, our hero is Tiller and this picturesque kind of, novel and I thought oh so he's going to steer the whole novel and then I realized no a tiller doesn't steer a boat somebody steers using the tiller yes my my girlfriend told me this and I was thinking yeah. I was going to come in here saying yeah so tiller is the guy who runs the whole book and yeah. in actuality that's not the case at all so rather than me rambling Maybe you could take off from there. Yeah, I, I'm glad you noticed that. <laughs> People are always asking me about where's this tiller come from, you know? Uh, and obviously, it's tongue in cheek, uh, but it's but it's straight on too. Which is, he's looking for a way to be guided through the world. Uh, you know, he's he's supposed to be at the tiller or or the, but but in fact, he's the thing by which a kind of pawn in certain senses, a kind of puppet in others. Um, but he's but he's embarked uh, kind of you know idly and not 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 really thinking too much on this uh, you know exploration of his realm. And but he doesn't know how big the realm is. He has no idea what it holds for him. He's just trusting uh, this this other fellow, this uh, what whom he sees as a mentor, this Chinese businessman named Pong. Uh, and hoping, I guess, that, uh, you know, it'll be interesting enough, like any 20-year-old kid might do uh, when, when presented with the idea, would you like to uh, join me in this, uh, you know, cross-Pacific trek? Uh, as I would have when I was 20 years old, I would have jumped at it. But, of course, I would have jumped at it blind and ignorant, which is, <laughs> which is a lot what Tiller does. And I had a lot of fun putting myself back in, into my 20 year old self, uh, that's, thinking that's about a, that. That's exactly what I did. And I was thinking, <laughs> okay, so when I was 20, would I have done this? And I go, yeah, I didn't have any plan at all. So if anyone suggested anything, that seemed okay to me. So <laughs> just do it. But, you know, and you know what? Like my dad always said, no matter what happens, it's not the end of the world and things will always turn out okay. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. far it yeah. works. Most of, the, most, most of the time that's most of the, the time. case. Most of the time that's the case. And, uh, and we laugh about it, but sometimes it isn't the case, right? Uh, Correct. I, well, know, we, ac we, accidents happen. And, and, and sometimes people are maybe more maligned than not. Uh, but, uh, and you get into their crosshairs intentionally or not. Uh, yeah, if you, if you talk about bad things happening, there are, I mean, if you th talk about just the concept of parents for both, um, for uh, Pong, for Tiller, um, you know, the losses that they've had have really affected their lives tremendously, right? And bring a lot oh, to the book. Oh, absolutely. I mean, it's one of the reasons why 
I wanted to make sure that this was not just a picaresque tale in the present with a lot of event and situation and that would be you know fun and flagrant and outlandish and bizarre i wanted all those things to happen in terms of the happenings but for me the most interesting part is why are these people on this quest right and what have they endured what's all the stuff that they've been carrying around that they haven't wanted to explore and that may, they maybe never will uh short of you know being forced to and in a way you know the story is a way to to put pressure on them and to uh and particularly on tiller uh and also pong too uh to do a little reckoning when 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 of course reckoning as we all know is kind of the hardest thing to do there are so many things that are uh you know what it's what makes it easy for an interview is always and i'll look at it right now is when well first of all the cover is really cool and second of all and you know i own a bookstore so as many times as people say don't judge a book by its cover pretty much every single person who's ever walked into my bookstore judges every book by its cover <laughs> it's true and i love this cover because when i first saw it i don't know you can tell me what you think but it looks so to me so much like a wpa era work yeah, in a funny does. way and uh and so it had an antique feel to it but like an antique feel thinking about the future and then and it's very colorful and and it has nothing to do with the book in you know in literally but somehow it gives the feeling of things piling on one another a lot of color uh so it's it's a kind of strange perfect perfect uh cover for me isn't it funny you just described yourself you described kind of an antique feel but looking toward the future you know uh -huh. like uh, your yeah. books it's like this, <laughs> yeah, yeah everyone always asking you about futuristic stuff and that's yeah. what you kind of just talked about actually uh -huh. um so what about the all right so the reason uh, i was going to talk about the, the epigraphs the thing about epigraphs is i always like asking about them because i know the author like any reader would good reader would must have thought a long time about the epigraphs mm -hmm. because it's like the cover of a jigsaw puzzle you know, there's Absolutely. the picture and inside are all the pieces. Yeah, yeah. And the epigraphs, um, for me, they 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 came early. I mean, I really? you know, these are books that I was, you know, that I've loved over the years. And um, but but there are three, you know, one from Malamud about heroes. Um, and that for me was one of the, um, you know, important notions of the book is that we need heroes and particularly this young kid Tiller needs a hero. He needs a mentor, a guide, someone to model himself after. Um, not exact, not to, to model himself exactly, but to, but to try to understand, you know, how, how can I be in any way special in the world? Maybe he can show me uh, because he's a kid and person who doesn't feel very special uh, and, 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 and can maybe light the path for, you know, where I'm going to go. Uh, and that's that's why we have mentors, heroes, um, big brothers and sisters. And then the other one, uh, there are two others, one from Mon, which is um, that about some about truly uh, if you truly love the world, you shape yourself to please it. And and that's an interesting idea. When I read that, I thought that's a great line um, because it's it says something about how the world is. That, in fact, we can't change the world. The world will proceed, it'll, it'll have its um, traumas and, and delights, uh, regardless of who we are. And, and if you love, truly love the world, truly love this life, uh, you'll, you'll in some ways um, recognize that and understand that, that you know, we're subject to it. And, and, and to really go along with it and enjoy it um and to take full advantage of it we can't tilt against the world uh because of course we're so small and flawed yeah and, uh, and the funny thing about it is the epigraph is almost like a template you could kind of lay it over more than one character in this book you mm, know absolutely absolutely and this book is definitely about about you know about ambition and striving but the limits of all that Right. Uh, in, yeah. in particular, say in the Pong story where his parents, his father particularly, was a lauded artist during the Cultural Revolution. Uh, uh, but because of one strange painting of Mao and the way that the political environment was and the philosophical environment, 
um, of the of the of the time that he he, be, he becomes crushed, as he says, uh, dirt on the heel of a shoe, uh, just by circumstance, um, and and that is something that's quite scary, I think, to us uh, in the world, and and I think, gosh, what we're seeing now through this pandemic. Just... I mean, you know, think about all the people whose livelihoods, say, running a restaurant, you know, um, being an airline attendant, um, a flight attendant, uh, where things were just doing really well. And through no fault of your own, this one virus pops up. And yeah, just... and all the stuff, all the stuff in the book resonates so much with what's happening. You know, you look at that painting of Mao, which is a great the way you describe the different paintings and what does just tip them over on that painting is amazing. But then you think about today and this concept of deep fake and you know mm. making a fake speech by Pelosi or something mm -hmm. like that. It's so much easier today. And then you talk about a failing restaurant today, but you also your whole the whole story of Punks talks about failing restaurants yeah, and what yeah. the consequences of those are. Oh God, sorry. So the last epigraph. Go ahead. Sorry. The, uh, oh yeah, and the last one is um, from uh, Lao Tzu is um, music in the soul can be heard by the universe. And again, when I read that, I uh, you know there, this is why we read, of course, because <laughs> you, know, you, you, you read lines like this and you and they'll they'll stick with you forever, and and not you know not necessarily in like oh yeah, I know exactly what that means. Sometimes it's just. Oh gosh, that there's a feeling there that is so profound and so deep. I don't know exactly all the ways in which that makes sense, but yeah. But if but for this book, I felt as if Tiller particularly uh, has a kind of music that has not yet been played inside. We all have this internal music, and and I think you know it's. It, this is a very hopeful quote that it is heard by the universe, but sometimes our music is not heard by everyone else in the universe. <laughs> and we want it to be. Uh, uh, but but it's, yeah. uh, it's an idea that, we're, that we, do have, we do have something rapturous and, glor and, and, and really beautiful and full of glory in us. It's just sometimes so damn hard to get it out uh, and to find yeah. it. Yeah, it's so funny because there's so many motive forces in this book, whether it's drum or, or lucky, for example, could, you could almost say the book pivots on lucky, but, you know, and then DJ and all that. But when, when I read the last epigraph, reread it after the, finishing the book, I realized that music in the soul, to me, that was drum, simply mm -hmm. because there was this deep understanding and comprehension. And I don't want to get into any spoilers and I won't. But there was just something about him that that last epigraph resonated with me. Oh. Do you want to hear a? Do you want to hear a? I'll give you an epigraph for your next book, but then you got to figure out what the book is about. <laughs> okay, listen to this. It is the height of bad manners to mention a rope in the house of a hanged man. <laughs> That's a good one. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, but we all have those ropes, obviously. <laughs> uh, you know, that's well. This is this is my dark my dark consciousness. The thinking is that we're we're all already hanged. <laughs> we all have the ropes <laughs> all around us. But we have sharp knives too. Yeah, we so. very have sharp knives. Yeah. <laughs> the other thing, you know, the other thing about Tiller. Now we can go back to the book. But the thing about Tiller is, is that. You know, as in all your books and because of who you are, and the same is true of me, is that Tiller is one eighth Asian. So in today's world, what does it mean to be one eighth anything? And why is it important to be one eighth of anything? Yeah, I, I absolutely wanted him to be almost something almost yeah. wholly something right and the idea was that particularly in the town he grows up in you know prosperous pretty white town a suburban town um that where that he would pass and that no one would really notice him you know he, he's basically someone who's who goes under the radar in every way even to himself and but i did want him to have just a little bit of difference enough so that he would be conscious of it and maybe curious about it where he, you know, he's he's he has this 
legacy from his mother, uh, who he doesn't really talk about her Asianness that much, um, because it's frankly not that important to him at the start of the book. But one of the ways in which he's, uh, you know, enraptured by Pong is the, the fact of Pong's Asianness. And, you know, it's no mistake, it's no accident in the novel that they go to, to Asia rather than to Europe. Right? You know, they're going to, they're going to, and, and that all of Pong's associates are Asian too. Um, you know, Tiller is just beginning, you know, unlike some of my other books where people, some of the characters are really wrestling more directly with their identity and maybe further along in their considerations and reckoning of those things, of that, of that, of those all, you know, everything that identity brings. Tiller is really at the start. Um, partly because of its age, partly just because he hasn't thought about it much yet. But I wanted to catch him at the start. So I didn't want to make it the whole novel. It, this is not a novel about ethnic racial identity primarily, but it's definitely informed by it. Uh, and there's a scene in the novel in which he talks about a friend of his who, uh, an Asian friend who goes skiing and is ski goggled and masked up. And and this nice old white couple, you know, kind of makes a, a ethnic slur against Asians, um, not knowing that he's Asian. And, and, I, and I felt that that was a, you know, a, metaf a, a kind of metaphor for, for, for Tiller and how he's going around in the world. Um, yeah. that, that he feels it inside, but, uh, but that no one really recognizes it or cares. It's funny, but when I, um, when I grew up in just outside of Philadelphia, my high school was 80% Jewish and I'm Jewish. And I thought, yeah, pretty much everybody must be Jewish. Yeah. And, uh, and then I went to the University of Florida and I went to law school there. And when I got my first job in Florida, they hired me. And every once in a while, I hear them talking about Jewing somebody down or something <laughs> yeah. like this. And, right. and I really didn't understand what the heck does that mean and all that. And so I felt I gave them just enough rope using rope again to hang themselves. And then I told them I was Jewish and I realized they never would have hired me. But now I felt bad for them because they were so sorry for all, all the things they had said in front of me. <laughs> exactly, exactly. And, and maybe even half the time, you know, and I, I came across that too. You know, they don't even know what that word means. It's just the word that exactly. they use. Yeah. Right? They yeah. don't even know what that means. And uh, really, because they, they don't know any Jewish people. <laughs> but <laughs> that exact thing happened to me all my life. Um, sometimes, know, yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, and, and stereotypes are a pain in the butt because, you know, you say do somebody down, that makes, means making a good deal. And I'm going, well, right. you know, that's not really that bad. <laughs> <laughs> it's just, I, I, I'm just Shylock. I'm just, yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Well, so here's something off the wall. So did you, you didn't register neighborlady.com, did you? No, I didn't. It's, you can buy it for $1,995 right now. No way. Yeah, you can buy it for wow. two grand. I was, I was thinking <laughs> you should buy it. And then all you have is the thing that says enter. And when you click enter, all you see is a swirling vat of mercury. <laughs> That'd be great. Why is it so expensive, neighborlady.com? My goodness. I thought these I things know, were $19. It, <laughs> well, yeah, but look, try and look for, uh, for a site for you. Try looking for nativespeaker.com. See if you right. can find that. <laughs> yeah, prob it probably is expensive. Yeah, yeah I know. I, it's really, it's fun. It's like a scavenger hunt looking for uh, domains now. But anyway, yeah, I just, I mean, I would give you a hundred bucks if you would buy it. <laughs> <laughs> I'll crowdfund that. Yes, we'll see if you yeah, maybe, uh, maybe Riverhead would do it. It would be kind of cool. Uh, <laughs> there's so many different things in the book, but I want, I didn't want to not talk about VJ. So why don't we describe him and his meals? Because, you know, you are a gourmet, gourmand. Uh, well, well, I don't know if I'm gourmand. I'm just a, uh, just a glutton, pretty much. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, he's, he's the son, uh, eight-year-old son of um, the woman that, um, Tiller shacks up with him after shacks up with after all his travels and the kid is you know uh, kind of a monstrous kid uh, bordering on sociopathic but uh, in trying to and they're homeschooling him so he's a, a big handful and in trying to you know figure out what the hell to do with him they they've suddenly discovered that he's got this just incredible innate talent for for cooking and and um and, and eating well eating first but then cooking later and uh and it's a you know comic way to to get into their domestic life for me 
because uh, that's the kind of domestic part of the story, but um, but also uh, a way to um, you know think about you know how people get into obsessions. Uh, you know there there are lots of obsessions in the book, uh, obsessions that lead to a lot of trouble. Um, and and maybe this food thing seems like it's going to lead to a lot of trouble, but it it, it ends up uh, leading to other things. Um, it's not the cause of trouble, but um, but I love food, and um, you know. But in the end, you know, this is not a book about how things taste. I think it's a, a book about hunger. Uh, well, yeah, book, and yeah. It's not just it's not just VJ, and you know, some of the reviews have even said, "Oh, wow, how come there's so much food in here?" Yeah. And, <laughs> and uh, but it's all that's why I'm saying it really bugged me because I, I was constantly hungry I, <laughs> like I said I did make an omelet because you say it, it's the simplest and the best and I realized it won't take me that much time yes. so, <laughs> and I did <laughs> and I, I I didn't flip it I did it like one of the, the cruise ship um, chefs who just you know tip it back and forth is that what right, you're talking right. about? Yes, yeah. exactly. That shaking where you just kind of let it go. And, and, I, and I've learned that um, long ago. Um, and I always tell my daughters, if you really know how to make an omelet, you don't need a spatula. You don't need anything. Um, yep. <laughs> lesson in life. Well, yeah, plus, especially if it's two o'clock in the morning and you shouldn't be eating anything anyway, which is, <laughs> I, it's all because of you. <laughs> And, you know, you talk about obsessions. I mean, I, we could go all over the place, but I mean, you know, some people, sometimes people say, I'm, oh, well, thank you for being such a close reader. And I'm going, well, you wrote a really good book. So obviously I should know what happened in it. <laughs> um, but yeah, karaoke is the other thing. Yes. It is because are you, do you, do you sing, do you do karaoke? I, I, I've been in lots of karaoke rooms where I am the reluctant singer. And because I'm such a bad singer. Um, well, that's what that's what Tiller thought, though. Yeah, that's what Tiller thought, and you know, it was my kind of hope that you know T Tiller's experience in the karaoke room, where he ends up being amazing, is exactly what I always fantasize about, but, but can never can never do. I mean, I should really just go away for a year and take some voice lessons, and you know, just practice one song where I can just belt it out, and then and I'd be done. <laughs> Yeah, I have one. The, the only song that is in my register for karaoke is Hotel California. Nice. And, and uh, yeah, it's great. It's perfect. And so, but I got my girlfriend this Model 3 Tesla for uh, Christmas. And Elon Musk being the wacko that he is, it has a karaoke mode. So. Oh, wow. I, I know. So I got my two daughters in the back seat and put it in karaoke mode. And um I sing Hotel California and they're so humiliated in the back seat <laughs> and disgusted and embarrassed. It, I feel bad, but I just can't not do it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, that's, we're all shower singers. The question is, yeah. should anybody be in the shower with us? <laughs> I know. And that's, you know, it's, it's when the drunker they, the drunker you get, the better you sound. Yeah, yes. at least to yourself. <laughs> at least, and to that's yourself. What, and that happens in the book too. Uh -huh. Absolutely. Absolutely. How'd you pick? How'd you pick the music like Caravan and ELO and even Blood, Sweat, and Tears? Where'd that come from? Well, it's because Tiller talks about his uh, mother being the real singer, oh. and as her mother, his mother, even though that wasn't her era of music growing up, uh, she was a kind of you know classic rock and folk uh r b listener and she she's a big lp collector in the book and so that's really where it comes from for the book for me it's a you know i've those are those are things that you know i'm, I'm a little bit too young to have listened to that in in the formative years of youth like teenagehood but but i've always loved those songs that are you know just soulful maybe a little sentimental um uh, you know, just are about the heart and uh, and breaking hearts usually. Uh, so those are the songs that, and I think those are the songs in karaoke that 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 work best <laughs> when I, when other people are singing them. <laughs> yeah, and it's like like you said about Tiller. You know, you know, not to continue the nautical metaphor, but he is in some sense at the beginning of the book, kind of at the beginning, like an empty vessel. Yes, and, yes. Uh, and he gets filled up with these talents. Well, even like 
and this really set the book off to me because it was a really good way to start it off was the golf game. Because at the beginning of the golf game, Pong had never played golf and Tiller had never caddied. Mm -hmm. Yet they both. They both figure it out. Yeah. <laughs> they both figure it out. And, and it's, you know, it's a surprise to Tiller and, and they have fun. And, and I think that's what I wanted to, to have Tiller engage with, which is he's trying stuff. And, and lo and behold, hey, it turned out okay. Hey, I actually have a little talent at it. Hey, you know, and, and this is something that we all kind of hope, right? That we somehow, we have these hidden capacities. We have these, these potential talents that, that and, and I know, and we all know because we know what of neurology and, and the amazing capacity of the human brain. We do have those things. It's just, we just need to be introduced. We need a hero to, to lead us through or to show us the way, you know, sing the tune with us. Yeah, but it's like, you know, it's also like that movie Sliding Doors or any of those situations where, you know, he just happened to be in exactly the right spot at the right time. Otherwise, his life, yes, this book wouldn't exist yeah. other than that invitation to do what that, that job. Exactly. You know? Exactly. And, and, yeah, go ahead. No, I was just going to say, there's nothing you can do about it. That's exactly what life is, every single nanosecond of it. Well, circumstance. Right, yeah. circumstance, the meeting. And I think about, you know, I d dedicate this book to my teachers and and I couldn't pick just one. I mean, I, I've i had so many teachers that without whom and librarians, uh, other, other kinds of teachers who without whom, I don't know where I'd be. I mean, it, it scares me to think about where I'd be without certain people saying things to me at certain points in my life. Or, or showing me something. I know. Sometimes I feel like, okay, you know, I've had this life. I'm an old, old white man now. And, uh, but I, and all I'm doing is having this bookstore. And then I realized, you know, what better thing could I have in my life? For, what could I do better than being a bookseller? And I could think about it. And there really, I can't think of anything. Like this 12-year-old kid came into my store. And he comes to the counter with a, with a copy of War and Peace. Uh, and I can't charge him for that. Why would I make him pay me? Why would I make him pay me? <laughs> well, that that's wonderful, right? I mean, yeah. It, it, yeah. I mean, the fact that a twelve-year-old kid's in a bookstore and not just on his device. First exactly. of all, amazing. You should have hugged the kid. But, <laughs> but and you did. You did by giving him more peace. I actually went back and got him another Russian author and brought it back. <laughs> Gave that to him too. But that's the thing. That's the thing about and it happened to you and it happened to me. It's like you I've never actually even hired anyone at the bookstore. They kind of just fall in. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? Mm -hmm. They just kind of fall into the store and then five years later there they are. Well, that's that's how we get into a lot of things, you know, and uh, even jobs we don't like, uh, but that teaches something. Uh, I've learned a lot from the, the shit jobs I've had in my life. <laughs> Me too. And I was a dishwasher, um, and you know, Tiller's a dishwasher, and I, uh, boy, I hated that job when I had it. But but looking back on it, so many interesting things happened in the in that summer of, of washing dishes. Yeah, and it's like you were saying about twelve-year-olds now, or say buying a TV now. If it if it doesn't work, you what are you going to do? Have call the TV repairman and have mm -hmm. them come and say, "No, you throw it away and buy another one." It's like, right. but think about when you were younger, and you had to save up in the old day for a TV. Like my then wife and I saved for a year to buy a TV for three hundred and six dollars. But that TV was so much more valuable to us than anything than, else right yes right right yeah, yeah, right exactly right. exactly, exactly. Uh, it's funny where value lies but which goes to the, another part of the book which goes to i guess the opposite of and again without trying to get too close to anything the concept of betrayal the concept of lies the concept of something that you thought was something turns into something else mm -hmm. Man, there's there's so many handles in this book, aren't there? Man. There are, you know, and it's um, it's a book that, and this is something. This is part of what I would consider the education of Tiller, <laughs> right? Uh, it's the going out in the world is not just experiencing. It's not just you know highs and lows. Some of those things and a lot of those things are um, activated. Um, 
and um, and authored, unfortunately, by those uh, we care about and love, and uh, or, or trust, and and that's one of the that's one of the things where he's a uh, you know he's he's a neophyte, he's a debutante, uh, but like all neophytes and debutantes, there is a moment where you think, wait a second. Maybe I'm not. Maybe this person doesn't have my best interests in, in in mind. Maybe, maybe there is evil in the world, or you know, malign intent, and and that's something that is really hard to deal with, um, because you know, I think I try to write Tiller, and I try to go out in the world thinking everyone is essentially good. <laughs> you know, everyone is essentially not trying to screw me, um, but but that's part. That's part of our, I guess, you know, the way we've made things. Uh, just because I think it's, we're human. I think it's better to live a life where you trust people and get screwed once in a while, without rather than just not ever trusting anybody. Don't you? Right. Right. Absolutely. And, and the people who feel like they're going to get screwed all the time end up people that the people who screw other people all the time because they just want to get the first shot in. Right. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. That like the whole thing's a duel. And, yeah, and right. that's and that's not it, right? And that's and that's been our country for the past four years, or yes, whatever. Yes, absolutely. I don't want to start. Don't start me on that. No. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. When you talk about him being a debutante, the closest the closest he is to a debutante in this book, almost a debutante who's been roofied, is with Constance. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Oh boy. <laughs> You can't be embarrassed by your own book. You have to tell us about her. Well, um, you know, he, he, he encounters the, the daughter of this um, very wealthy businessman, and, and she's very attractive to him. Um, and it turns out that he's even more attractive to her. <laughs> he doesn't know it. Uh, and he gets into a, you know, he he ends up being the subject of an arcane uh, sexual practice that, <laughs> that, that, that I didn't know about. People always ask me, well, you know, what kind of research do you do for the book? <laughs> and I say, I did not research this part of the book uh, personally. <laughs> but, um, but again, I wanted, I wanted him to, you know, Tiller to, you know, he has a good attitude, right? He wants to, he, he's attracted to this young woman, but it turns out this woman has her own, you know, agenda too, as people yeah. do. <laughs> she, it's funny. It's funny. And, and she it, introdu introduces him to something that, he, as he says afterwards, when do you know when you've gone too far? <laughs> and, uh, but I, I hope it's not just comic uh, and awful, but also a way for him to, to realize, hey, this was traumatic, but you know what? Uh, on the other side, I'm still alive. I'm still okay. And and maybe, as he says, maybe it wasn't so bad. <laughs> you know? Well, I was going to say that, but you, I'd rather have you say it. Um, well, the thing is, if we're trying to sell your book here today, that's going to do better selling it than anything we've talked about. Once you say something, an arcane sexual practice that you didn't know about and I didn't know about, everybody is going to buy this book, right? Yeah, you'll have to look it up. Have the have the internet ready. <laughs> well, the word is such. Oh, it's a nautical word too. Yes, it is. It is a nautical word. I didn't even think about that. <laughs> it's a nautical word. Well, they are plumbing the depths. <laughs> but yeah, well, okay. If you think of that as being oh, here, okay. I'm not going to do any spoilers. But would you like to talk about mortars and pestles? Yes. Uh, well. There's, uh, as you mentioned, there's uh, an interest in, in food and food making <laughs> in this book. And, and as I did with, as I felt right, right from the beginning, I knew that this book would be a steady, uh, a study in uh, a steady escalation. So if, if in the first part of the book, you know, VJ, as you, VJ, as I call him, is making, you know, gourmet little items, I knew that Tiller would end up having to make some food himself, but in a in a in a different way and in, in a way writ large, uh, in, in in ways that were horrifying. And so there's this you know kind of crazy chef he meets who has a lot of power over him, and uh, the chef has his own business uh, where he's making curries, and and essentially uh, you know he enslaves Tiller. <laughs> to, 
to to be his mode of production and he has this you know kind of marxist art ideology and he, he he's he, i think he's trying to teach a tiller you know this is another opportunity for tiller to learn another lesson about economics and, and capitalism <laughs> and the and, and the modes of production <laughs> Well, it's also the other interesting. Yeah, you you could really go down the rabbit hole with the book because you know I was thinking about um, Pruitt, right? Pruitt. Yes. Yes. Pruitt. Yeah. Who who assumes he's be he's who assumes that Tiller is being groomed as his successor. He's an interesting character too. It's like out of something out of the Count of Monte Cristo or something. <laughs> yes, I love. You know, he's he was the character that maybe I had most fun with. You know, I'd yeah, I'd, uh, I'd yeah. encountered. You know, we'd all know about the story of you know Western guy goes to Asia, te- goes to teach English, backpacks all over the place, uh, as uh, as he's accused by his um, boss Chili's the the crazy chef. You know that. Uh, the soft imperialism of uh, you know a guy in a one hundred dollar uh, tivas uh, teaching English, uh, betting local women, and, and so supposedly supporting the local economy. But uh, but I want to have you know as with other parts of the book, have fun with some you know uh, tropes about Westerners and Easterners and and where people end up. Uh, uh, but but in I hope in a in a way that that doesn't um, that doesn't uh, completely grind him to nothing. You know, he's got a lot of goodness too. Uh, but he's but he's subject. I wanted him to be subject to, um, uh, you know, the the full I suppose implications of his traveling, <laughs> and when he and the the fact that he's that he's made a new life in Asia, even if it's not of his own making, um, maybe it's something he can he can accept. You know, when we when we talk about all these different aspects of it. You know, it always goes to the reviews are all going to say genre bending or something like that. And so not that I ever do it anyway, but if someone asks you or they will review it and say it's genre bending, what genre would you say this book is? Oh, gosh. It's you know, I, so, said pick, uh, I said picaresque and you yeah. kind of alluded to that. But Yes, it's well, I think it's many I really do think it's many books. It's all the books that I wanted to write at the moment, which is it's a picaresque novel. It's a coming of age novel. It's a midlife crisis novel. It's a, it's a sensualist novel, a novel about aesthetics. Um, it's, and it's also not quite a realistic novel. You know, it starts out uh, to be like a realistic novel, but then it, it becomes it becomes a sort of absurdist novel. And um, so I, I don't know what it is, but it just, I wanted to, someone, someone else I was talking to said that it felt like you were juggling all these balls in the air. And, and I said, yeah. And you know, what I kept doing was adding balls. And at some point, you know, as the juggler, there's none of them are in his hand. (laughs) And I felt like, Maybe that's the same thing with the genres in this book. It, you know, it's like I had maybe 20 different little genres all mixing up. Well, it's not giving anything away, but if you think about it, you know, if, in the beginning I thought, oh, I wonder if this is going to go like into the realm of magical realism or something like that. And then I realized it didn't. But then if you think of Sharp Knives, which we've been talking about all morning, you know, like there it is. You know yes. what I mean? Yes, <laughs> there it is. <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, so it's almost like why, how, you know, it did because you don't, you don't have him. Uh, I won't go there, but you know what I mean, right? You don't. Well, I, th- I think, I think what I want, I think maybe the way that I would describe it, if I had to as a reader, is I think you, I make you think that you're comfortable in this genre, and then suddenly it's not quite that genre. And then it's, and then you think, oh no, no, it's this genre, and then it's not quite comfortable in the genre. And I've always been a genre, an interested genre reader. In my first book, I talk about that, uh, and more genre as it has to do with his personal identity. Uh, but the kinds of people we are, uh, ethnically, sexually, you know, racially. But, but in this book. Uh, it's definitely a book that talks more about kinds of storytelling and kinds of characters. Uh, yeah. Uh, so, and it's also an immigrant, this is also an immigrant novel. 
right? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yes, all, it definitely. Is. It's it's also a striver, American striver novel. Uh, have, you ever also, met any, have you ever met been, anyone like Pong? Yes. And the, so have I. The, yes. Yes. Absolutely. Um, both, uh, you know, East Asian and South Asian people a lot in in my in when I was living in Jersey, and and absolutely the the inspiration for Pong. We're we're on the Jersey Shore. What beach are you talking about in the book? No, no, not Jersey Shore. I I lived in Princeton. Yeah, I know. But when you allude to the Jersey, oh, Shore. oh, oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, well, more like uh, Barnegat and oh, okay. uh, yeah, yeah, all, all over there. Yeah, because we have a house in Stone Harbor. You know, we're Stone Harbor, Avalon. Yeah, 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 yeah. More south, I guess. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. It's interesting, you know, because you know. In your reviews, are you know everyone's always going to say Asian, Asian, Asian. But when we're talking about handles, it just so happens that that's what you naturally gravitate. Just like the story I told you about me becoming an attorney. It's yeah. not the yeah, you know what I mean. And that's what people sometimes forget. You know yeah. that 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 <laughs> it's, you know I, this is what I tell my writing students is like don't force anything. Don't feel like you have to write about anything. If you write about your life and you happen to be an Asian immigrant, all those things will come into it in, to the extent that you're interested. They can't help but be, you know, that be included. Uh, if you're not interested, if you're an Asian immigrant, you're interested in Victorian literature and, and Edith Wharton, great. That's what will come into it. And you'll, and you'll turn the story in an interesting way. You know, be yourself rather than be what you think other people expect you to be. I don't um, want to write a book like Ethan Frome. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, Although that had almost as, that has as, as a dramatic an ending as your book for sure. Uh, yes, yes. Well, all those books. Yes. <laughs> all these, all these books. You know, it's funny because people always ask me about my reading uh, education, and and I was I was you know educated in all the the whole the whole Western canon, right, from the classics to, you know, Victorian literature, Edwardian literature, mod, you know, postmodernism, everything. And I do remember, you know, say reading, you know, a Henry James novel or Edith Wharton novel or an English novel and thinking, you know, at the time, like, gosh, why am I reading about all these privileged white people who are just trying to get laid or not trying to get laid? <laughs> basically, basically, it was all about that to me. And sometimes I just throw the book across it. You know, I, I, I'm, I admired the prose, but I just kind of, you know, <laughs> want to chuck the book against the wall. <laughs> but, but of course, you know, I learned a lot from those books too. <laughs> uh, it, you know, both of us, you know, both of us cherish books. And obviously I do as a bookseller and you do as what you just described. But have you ever hated the book so much that you actually did throw it across the room or out the window? I've done it like five times, I think. Yeah. I kind of do that sometimes, you know, just uh, just because I, I have, I guess I have so much, so much hope for every book <laughs> that I get <Yeah>. disappointed. <laughs> I'd never say anything to the writer, you know, but, you know, uh, and I won't mention the books, but, but they're books that, that aren't necessarily so bad. They're books actually that, that disappoint me because they could almost have been good. Uh, it's funny. Uh, yeah, that's. That's really and, interesting. And that, and that, in fact, like almost a good book that ends up being really ordinary. And, and somehow that depresses me um, and, and makes me sad. <laughs> well, and look, the book made you feel. So, I mean, yeah. you know. It, yeah, that's it gave, true. <laughs> that's true. <laughs> but yeah, it's, you're right. And it's always the ending, too, where you think, oh, it's either a deadline or she, she or he didn't want to do something. But it's not the ending that actually your book, and I'm, again, I, I don't want to, I'm not going to spoil anything, but your book at the end with regard to the smartest guy in the book, it ends in such a way, it's almost like a Marvel comic. Like you think, oh, I wonder if there's going to be a sequel to this. Mm. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Kind of? Yeah. 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 And I and I won't I won't ever write sequels. I don't like to do that. People have asked me all the time, but I did want to leave off so that, especially especially in this book, you know, about heroes, about people who who exist. I, you can't kill them off, not fully. You can't. You just can't. It's just cruel. 
<laughs> I, I know it's like more it's like moriarty yeah yeah exactly uh so you, you know i i want i want his specter to be always there because it is always there for for tiller it's yeah. absolutely always there oh yeah, yeah. like we're, like we were talking about meeting someone like pong it's like when you meet these people and generally in my life you, i can count them on the fingers of one hand there is something about them there's either a light or you can use the cliche like there's an old soul or something like that but it's just like everything <clears throat> falls into place in their life but with apparently no effort on their part exactly exactly and and that's something that that's their magic yeah and, and we and you encounter you don't encounter that kind of magic very often and no and, and, and you and if, once you see it you can't let it go you you really just can't yeah well that's a good spot to stop i guess yeah yeah that's a great <laughs> spot yeah so thank you so much it was a pleasure talking to you so much it was a fun conversation which you know isn't always <laughs> yeah sometimes it's just hey could you tell us about your book right right <laughs> right all you get exactly 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 <laughs> okay so chang Ri, thanks so much for being with us here today and i really enjoyed talking to you okay great good luck with the the store and and good luck with that 12 year old i i i i hope we'll be hearing from that kid someday I'm sure we will. We will. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Bye.